collections here at the Fitzwilliam Museum, who is going to be in conversation with Maggie. So I'm just going to hand over to him to introduce her, but I would just ask you to give a very warm welcome to Maggie Hamlin and David Spritz. Thank you.
where Britain walked every day and where he was inspired by the sun and the sea. So that's a good painting of how the thing might look once it was achieved. And what moved you to put the words on the scholar? Well, that phrase, I hear those voices that will not be drowned, from Peter Grimes, I thought had universal sort of significance. It says something to everyone. I mean, we all have voices inside us, and uh, people contemplate the horizon, have conversations with themselves and the sea. Everybody does. And so it was, I thought it would just have some meaning for everybody. Next. <laughs> <laughs> the maquette, <laughs> made of real sculptures. And that little person there is not Benjamin Britten. It's a little person made of pipe cleaners to show the scale of the sculpture. And what, what um, deliberation did you have to get the scale of the sculpture? What made you choose the height of the field? Well, I'd taken a scallop shed, a shed <coughs> to Pegs of Albrook. Next, uh, next year, Pegs will have been working with steel for 100 years in Albrook. They're master craftsmen with steel. And I had taken an ordinary scallop shell to Sam, who, uh, the elder Peg, and he'd come out of the office and I'd handed him this scallop shell and I said, could you make me one of those? And he passed it back to me and said, well, I could. <laughs> and I passed it back to him. And he said, uh, I said, well, how big could you make me one of those scallop shells? And he said, oh, I said, well, as tall as that, I said, pointing vaguely upwards. And he said, well, oh, he said, I could. Said, That'd be quite a lot of work. <laughs> Handed me back the shells, and the shells exchanging hands between my small hands and Sam's big hands for quite a while. But I took that all as a positive thing. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, the, the previous uh, image was uh, what you see if you're driving along that bit of coast road between Albury and Fort Ness, the, the, the big standing shell, which is rather sort of surreal. And uh, then if you're interested enough in wondering, wondering what it's all about, and you park the car and get up the shingle. This is the view of the sculpture from the side where the sea is. I hope there's a bit of explosion to it because I can remember first when I first heard Britain's music, there was this sort of explosive thing going on, which I tried to echo. And what about the colour? It's nice, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What made you choose that rusty colour against the silver grey? Well, steel is a very um, beautiful but difficult medium to work in. I mean, it's 10 mil of stainless steel, which, is, which it had to be for strength, and the marine conditions and the rest of it. Uh, and I wanted some contrast in it, you know, the contrast between the highly polished parts and what I wanted, the rusty parts, but well, it is impossible to rust stainless steel. Because <laughs> once the thing had got going, it pegs, we were going up and down the yard, fitting around with bits of acid, with various strengths, on a bit of stainless steel for ages, and it wouldn't. So how did you get that effect? The, the darker parts of the sculpture were sent to Lowestoft, to the galvanizers, where they were baked in an oven. And that can make steel Next. This is one of your little secrets. Yes. Um, in reality, that painting is only 10 inches by 12 inches, so you're seeing it rather larger on these screens. So there was a, I made the maquette. Simon came to see it. He was very enthusiastic. Um, and uh, obviously, there was going to be all the troubles of permissions and getting the money and the rest of it. And so I started to paint the sea. Uh, it was November the 30th, uh, 2002, um, when I had driven to, the, to look at the sea early in the morning, and there was this huge storm. It was very exciting, and you know, the sea and the sky and the whole thing, and the, the, the pebbles were crashing. It was extraordinary. And uh, I went back to the studio, and it wasn't until 3 o'clock in the afternoon 
uh, that Sunday, that I began to wonder why I was painting a portrait of a beggar from memory, a London beggar, um, in my studio, when what was inside me was the experience of that storm that morning. So I painted the first little scene <coughs> vertically on this canvas, it was a portrait way up. So I painted the first little scene painting vertically on that very same canvas, and then that really began the North Sea Paintings series. Next. I can't think who this is. <laughs> 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 in which one sank pretty immediately. <laughs> anyway, that's the old Peter friend of age four. I'm amazed you went to French. My mother is a snob. <laughs> <laughs> Next. <laughs> well, that's a bit better. That's Cam Camberwell in the 60s. What colour was your hair? Red. What sort of red? As <laughs> red as I can get it. <laughs> Next. So that's the seventies. What a, a lo lovely civilized thing to be doing. <laughs> <laughs> if anyone could be doing it now. <laughs> Next. Yes, what? Yes, but not here. <laughs> oh, let. <coughs> What's happened to his teeth? Let uh, was my mentor. Um, he, together with Cedric Morris, ran the East Anglian School of Painting and Drawing. It's where many years before me, Lucian Freud had started to paint. And he became my mentor. He uh, said the most important things to me that anyone did. Uh, like, <coughs> I worked with him in the kitchen, cutting up vegetables, all that sort of thing. And he said the marvellous thing, that if I was going to be an artist, I should make my work my best friend. So that whatever I was feeling, you know, whatever anyone's feeling, tired, bored, brandy, whatever you're feeling, go to your work and have a conversation with it. And that is how I've lived my life. And so that was a very important thing to have said to someone aged 15, cutting up carrots. And uh, the other important thing he said was there's no point in anyone thinking they're going to be an artist without imagination. That also is very important. Uh, so he said these marvellous things. He was also very vain. And so he designed his own false teeth. <laughs> he didn't think that national health teeth would be sort of flattering. So he designed these teeth. And of course they didn't fit. <laughs> and he did have a wonderful laugh, but um, so pretty quickly, once the mouth was open in this extraordinary laugh, the teeth would drop. <laughs> but somebody had taken a photograph, this black and white photograph, taken of lead at the prime time of his laugh before the teeth fell and died. So that photograph, I don't often use a photograph, but that was the, the beginning of that painting of lead laughing. It's very difficult to paint laughing people. Well, of course it is. Mm. You know, one step wrong and there's a scream. <laughs> <laughs> we all know who's done that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I love the chaos of the face. Abandon. <coughs> it's a sort of sexy thing, too. I mean, everything goes when you really laugh. It's great. Next. That's Another my friend. One. Another one. My friend Tori Lawrence Larkin. It is a, quite a challenge, but it's the challenge I enjoy. I mean, the only person who ever managed to pose for me, laughing convincingly, for three quarters of an hour while I drew it, was Max Wall. <laughs> Nobody else can laugh convincingly without stopping, in my experience, for three quarters of an hour. Amazing. Amazing. Did he make you laugh? Quite a lot, yeah. Well, he wasn't being miserable. <laughs> God would be a comedian right next. <laughs> So what's this? Oh, no. <laughs> it's, uh, I did a lot of stuff at sunrises during the 80s. And this is a watercolour. And I think you can see the beginnings. You can only see things afterwards, many years afterwards. The significance of them. And I think this watercolour, sunrise, has sort of connections with the whole thing of the skull. I mean, the, the dome of the, the constable's dome of the sky, and the 
raises the sun going up. Uh, and I did know to find a connection between that and skull. Yeah, shape. For instance. Yes. Next. <laughs> Sam Page. Very big. <coughs> Very big. Uh, uh, on the floor in front of him. What bits of the skull? And how you. You see, what, what happened was, what happened was that I, <coughs> I took the maquette, the model that you see, along to Pace. And they looked pretty amazed, and of course there weren't any drawings. They're used to working with engineering drawings and that sort of thing, and they certainly never made a sculpture before. And all they have is my maquette, you know, the scale, the size of the sculpture. Uh, so I, about once a week, I would telephone uh, and say, has anything started yet? <laughs> and Sam would say, we've been looking at it. I'd <laughs> 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 you know, give it, give it you know, we ring up and say, have we started anything yet? And he'd say, we've been looking at it. <laughs> um, anyway, that was quite a lot of that. And then, East Anglia and Daily Times got wind of something happening in Ubra. And, uh, this girl uh, called Sarah Chambers said, could she come to Pegs on Friday morning and talk to the Pegs and me and take some photographs? So I rang Peg and I said, uh, Sam, I mean, and I, I said, look, the East Anglian's coming on Friday morning, for God's sake, do something. <laughs> so they managed the first one of the runnels of the sculpture <coughs> set up. And she came along and I said to Sam and Dennis, they're all actually called Dennis, which is very muddling. <laughs> Sam's father's called Dennis, Sam's called Dennis, and his son is called Dennis. <laughs> they like the name. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, I, said, I said to Sam and Dennis, look, we've got to look real, please look really enthusiastic, really, you know, it's really exciting what we're going to be doing here. We're going to be keen. <laughs> uh, well, anyway, so, <laughs> so we went to the workshop, and I did all my artist and spiel about it. And then she turned with her notebook and looked up at Sam and said, and what do you think it's going to be like when it's a work of art on the beach? And there was a very long pause. <laughs> and Sam said, oh, reserve judgment. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think was marvellous, because she didn't put it in the article. <laughs> Next. <laughs> right, the heritage is beginning to take shape. And, and the curve, I mean, what angle is it at? Well, that's underneath the curve bit. <laughs> yes, but I mean, how did you work out the angle of which to... Well, it, was abs it is amazing, it just the real thing... Worked out from the top. Yeah, from the model, from that tiny maquette. Yeah. I mean, it took, I think it took about seven months to make. And, and each, you see, each it tiny thing. thing. Yes, yes, each tiny section of, you know, with about that size of each of the long runnels um, had to be cut and bent individually to completely fit the and next one. It was a machine. The machine. Next. <coughs> I think I like it. How did they get it out of the look? <laughs> <laughs> Great difficulty on yeah. the things that go along the ceiling. And a lot of sort of manpower. Next, the no, scene. no, run along those. There we are, outside now. See, we've got it outside somehow. <laughs> there is Sam, there is Dennis, there is me. In the workshop. He looks as if he's about to beat it. I think he might sit in some medieval pose. <laughs> Next. Ah, oh, yes, these are the foundations going into the uh, beach. Who, whose idea was it to create this sort of foundation? I mean, how did you decide what was needed? Well, Sam did, really. And then, you know, so there's, an, an, as you see, a big flat tray, and then these bits come up, and then the scallop was lowered uh, when it was in place. Uh, there are about four tons of, uh, four tons of shingle between that tray at the bottom and the beginning of the scholar that shows about the ground. And how much does the train weigh? I don't know. <laughs> a lot. It weighs a lot. Well, yes, it's hard. I could have no way. I mean, people, strange people,
people who would like to see it removed will have quite a lot of trouble with it. The very wide still up in the air, about to be lowered on the foundation. Next. Ah, yes. This was like the hardest task of the lot to veil this sculpture <laughs> so that it could be unveiled. <laughs> And this is agricultural fleece. And it was, it was a very windy Friday afternoon. It was going to be unveiled at 12 noon on Saturday. It was very windy, so Dennis, of course, climbed up to the top of it, and uh, anybody walking along the beach, I just told them to kneel on the fleece, you know, to keep it down, <laughs> so he could fix it. I mean, it was all quite a... And there's a wonderful, well, there was a wonderful moment, a wonderful moment. It was the end of Friday, it had enormous you know, a thing with this piece, and we were ready. It was about five o'clock on Friday. And Dennis and I were sitting beside the scholar. Uh, pretty weary, but sort of happy. It was all ready and done. And this, I would say, rather typically, all right, woman, <laughs> stomped towards us up the shingle. <laughs> And, and stood there and said, um, is this the sculpture? <laughs> <laughs> so Dennis, Dennis, I thought I would I'm not saying anything really to Dennis. He said, this is it. And so she said, yes, I can see. It's been delivered. <laughs> Been delivered, but where is it going? So we said, This is it. <laughs> All he said was, This is it. <laughs> and finally she got the message. And so she put her hand to her brow and said, Oh my God, how frightful. I thought it was going somewhere far less conspicuous than this. <laughs> and it stumped off down the ship. Now I don't know. <laughs> How long did it take to build up? You've not been listening, David. <laughs> I've said already, and all these intelligent people there said months. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, had I said before? Yes. yes. <laughs>
Oh, yes. My, my brother is in a pub in Norfolk, and he and uh, two old boys were drinking, and he overheard the words for them. So he thought he'd listen. And one said to the other, they should have had that there in the war. <laughs> that they kept the Germans out, saved on the barbed wire. <laughs>
rises, rises up out of a large curve, 20th building called the Princeton Deck in the center of Princeton. And the heron itself, it's a weather vane, and the heron is three meters tall. So sculpture is continuing a big part of the world. Yeah. And what ambitions do you have? <laughs> <laughs> So I go on painting the sea. Yes. And small tiny Yes. And any exciting project in your mind? I've got one or two things on the boil. But it's very sort of it's uh, uh, well I'm lucky to talk about things you're doing. Well, yes, you're not. What? <laughs> Are there any more of these lovely pictures? <laughs> or is that the last one? Oh, that's the last one. <laughs> 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 no, no, the audience is supposed to ask the last question. I'm not a fortune teller. Life, life decides what I do. You know? Very apt when my art mistress at school said, always let a subject choose you. You don't choose a subject, okay? I got a cross about Barbara's attitude to Benjamin Britten, and that's how that happened. Um, the commission came up for the Oscar Wilde sculpture, and you know, several people in for it. And Oscar Wilde had always been very, very, very important to me. I asked for his complete works on my 12th birthday, which I mean, I had the parents trained by then. <laughs> they wondered rather. So Dorian Gray was the first book I read. Whether it had any effect, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, I mean, while it would be very important to me, I was thrilled when I was chosen to make it. It wouldn't have gone down well in Saffron Ward. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. I don't know. Would anyone like to ask a question? Yes. Um, I mean, my husband loved it. 
Uh, well, thank you. You have an intelligent husband. <laughs> <laughs> my brother said when I gave it to Suffolk Coastal District Council, I should have suggested that in return I had two and a half percent of the takings from the car park. <laughs> 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 You're a very rich person. <laughs> Buying your modern art exhibition 
child of yours ever seen? Do you know, I have no memory of doing that. <laughs> I'm glad I was good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, painting Max Wall. I wonder what I was doing, painting Max Wall and taking people around the Fitzwilliam. <laughs> but life is a mystery, isn't it? <laughs> The art I like looking at. Apart from the drawing exhibition, 
Now, like, off the deadline, you mean my top six or something like that? Rembrandt always, Mark Rothko always, Lake Titian always, Van Gogh always, and other people come in the night. Um, living painters I admire very much, Cy Trombley. He's my favorite living painter. They're speechless. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 